I've got two after. So, uh, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Jonathan Chavon, uh, former faculty member here, uh, now working in private industry here in DC and uh, US Navy commander. Uh, um, we're gonna, we've got a great panel set up for today. Um, two really fascinating papers covering very different sides of the Cold War, uh, but both talking about Cold War force structure in, in different ways. Um, our first uh, presenter today is Dr. Stephen. Is it is is, is it Paget or Paget? I don't remember how to pronounce your last name, Stephen. Hey, it's Paget. Paget. Okay, uh, appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Dr. Paget. He's uh, currently at the, uh, joining. Well, he's joining us from uh, jolly old England at the University of Lincoln. He is the military program director for the School of Computer Science and the College of Education. Prior to this role, he served as the Director of Air and Space Power Education and as a reader in international security at the University of Portsmouth. Responsible for the university's provision of academic support at the Royal Air Force, College Cranwell, and RAF Halton. He has been involved in professional military education throughout his career as an advocate of internationalization and in education. He has taught at universities and special military education in Australia and New Zealand. Research focuses on multinational military cooperation. Uh, as you will see from his paper. He's published one book, edited another, and authored several articles on the topic of multinational operations. Particularly interested in the dynamics of interoperability, especially the importance of human and of cultural and human interoperability. And uh, he specializes again in, in PME and uh, multinational cooperation, international security. And uh, he's got a lot of things on the side as well. So, uh, again, so, you know, this, uh, if you're curious, uh, this is not because I got in a bar fight. Uh, I, uh, I have an allergy to ragweed, and it's the wrong time of season uh, for me. So I just happen to, despite my best efforts, you know, it's, it happens anyway. So, but anyway, it won't hurt you. All right, Steve, I'll let you go ahead and get started, and uh, we'll, we'll kick things off. All right, thank you, Jonathan, for that introduction. Um, sorry I can't be there in person. Hopefully the technology holds out for this. Um, I do seem to be having a few bandwidth issues. I can see in the screen in the background that I'm still visible at the moment, so the camera's holding out. When I start sharing my screen, I may just knock the camera off to make sure that I keep the connection. But if any point, obviously, the, the audio drops off or, or the screen, just let me know, and I will uh, try and get that corrected. So if you just bear with me for one second, I'll get the PowerPoint up. Can you see the PowerPoint at the moment? Yes, we're good. Okay. All right, I'll go back to that. Is that on full screen now? It, it is, yes, you're good. Okay, all right, well, thank you everyone. Um, so my talk today is gonna to be on the uh, USS Claude Ricketts mixed manning demonstration. Um, it's of interest to me, uh, in some ways less so for the, for the actual operation itself and the concept of of multinationalization and multinational crews working together. So that's the particular area of angle uh, that I'm looking at really in the, in the area that I'm interested in, in with that topic. So the concept of multinational crews has a long lineage uh, in naval in navies, and that's been exemplified, for example, by the diverse manning of ships during the Napoleonic War. Richard Rose has noted that Admiral Horatio Nelson's call to his seamen at Trafalgar, England expects that every man will do his duty, was addressed to crews that were more multinational than a NATO force would be today. While large-scale mercenary mobilisation declined in Europe in the 19th century, non-state mobilisation continued. Restrictions on international recruitment have diminished multinational diversity amongst naval crews for obvious reasons, but despite the ongoing, but there is still the ongoing presence of personnel born in different nations, including those on exchange. So while the range of nationalities represented amongst naval crews may have declined, the diversity of navies in multinational formations has expanded. The frequency of multinational operations has also obviously increased over the past few decades. So taken together, the prevalence of multinational operations and the diversity of coalitions 
has heightened the importance of interoperability. Jason Dittmer has contended between the Second World War and the Trump presidency, American defence policy worked to create a sense of Western-led collective security that has, for good or ill, dominated world politics. Interoperability has underpinned this world order. So a pertinent example of the importance of interoperability was the so-called mixed manning experiment that was conducted as a demonstration of the feasibility of plans for a North Atlantic treaty organisation, multilateral nuclear force. And I suppose that's the key element of this. It was intended originally that force would be uh, nuclear. The idea was dismissively described by the famed British Army Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery as utter and complete poppycock. However, the results of the demonstration indicated that irrespective of the wider complexities surrounding a multilateral nuclear force, a mixed man crew was not only feasible, but could be extremely affected under the right conditions. Moreover, the challenges faced and the limitations of a mixed man crew emphasise the importance of interoperability. The Claude V. Ricketts demonstration was ultimately a significant milestone in the history of NATO military cooperation. And moreover, given the ever-increasing importance of multinational cooperation and international interoperability, this unique case study demonstrated numerous considerations that have contemporary relevance. So I'll just take a, a minute here um, to divert, just to, to cover the subject of interoperability very briefly. Uh, I won't dwell on it for too long, but I think it's, it's just worth mentioning um, for those less familiar with the topic. So I think the mixed manner demonstration is particularly pertinent as, as the achievement of interoperability is both an expensive and challenging endeavour. And it's also a complex and multifaceted concept. Major General Dwayne Gamble and Colonel Michelle Letcher, US Army, have cited three dimensions of interoperability, technical, procedural and human. Now, different people break down interoperability into different categories, depending on their perspective, but I'm, I'm using those three broad categories today. Now, each element in that is vital, but in the absence of technical compatibility, the human and procedural elements have proven to be particularly important. Significant time and effort have been expended on procedural interoperability and the prevalence of NATO standards has been essential in that regard. Now, human interoperability, while seemingly straightforward, should not be underestimated as personal relationships have underpinned the, co the cohesion of naval coalitions throughout history. Now, I mentioned the historical perspective earlier, and again, I won't dwell on this for too long today, but just a bit of background um, to, about historical mixed manning, although on a much more limited scale. So the deployment of international detachment to ships of another Navy is, is far from a new idea, as you'll be aware. As an example, the issuance of operation orders and signals in a foreign language necessitated the deployment of Russian liaison officers and telegraphists aboard vessels of the Royal Navy's Baltic submarine flotilla while operating alongside the Imperial Russian Navy during the First World War. Conversely, British naval liaison officers commanded teams of up to 10 signalmen, telegraphists, essentially radio operators and coders aboard vessels from the French, Hellenic, Netherlands, Norwegian, Polish and Yugoslavian navies in the Second World War in order to safeguard and facilitate communications with the Royal Navy. Now, those detachments were obviously provided for necessary practical reasons but they further demonstrated that international components could function aboard a ship and they did help to improve interoperability between the navies, although on a much more limited scale. So the principle of mixed man crews was therefore reasonably well established prior to the Claude V. Ricketts experiment during the Cold War, although not on the scale that would be attempted during that demonstration. Now, there's quite a bit of background to the demonstration, uh, much of which I won't have time to cover today. But for those less familiar with it, I'll, I'll go over a few areas just to give you an idea of how this demonstration came about. The impetus for the demonstration was essentially consideration of a NATO multilateral nuclear force, which would involve a mixed manned fleet of Polaris equipped ships coming under multilateral control. Originally, there were discussions about a potential submarine force, but that was dismissed for a number of reasons. Now, the, the proposed composition scope and ultimate feasibility of the MLF, as it became to be known, were, uh, beyond the scope of the presentation. But the context in which it was discussed is important in understanding some of the negativity that surrounded not only the concept, but also the demonstration conducted to prove the feasibility of mixed manner. The MLF was primarily a US initiative and was driven by multiple factors. 
There was pressure from several European NATO nations for more participation in nuclear weapons matters as one means for increasing the cohesiveness and solidarity of the alliance. There was also a potential mechanism to diminish what was con conceived as a possible desire for an independent West German nuclear capability. And there was also the prospect of increasing political unity in Europe. So all of those factors came together to uh, lead to this consideration of the multilateral force. Now, interestingly, the military value of the force was acknowledged not to be the primary consideration in some circles, although obviously many of these discussions took place behind the scenes. So in the minutes of a cabinet meeting on the morning of the 30th of May, in 1963, the British Minister for Defence was paraphrased as having outlined that from the military point of view, the proposed force would add nothing to the deterrent power of the West, since so long as its use remains subject to the United States veto, it would only be employed in circumstances in which the independent United States different forces, which were in themselves of overwhelming strength, had already been committed. So while the force was inherently military in nature, the significance was seen to, to transcend the cooperation between the navies themselves. Arthur Schlesinger recorded, though it served no strictly military function, some military men looked much askance on the idea of mixed manning and the Joint Chiefs of Staff never liked the MLF. It appealed to the advocates of strategic interdependence as a means of preserving the unity of the deterrent and at the same time of giving NATO allies a nuclear role. Now, it was hoped, nevertheless, though, that mixed manning would enhance rather than dilute the quality of a ship's crew. The UK Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs proposed the multilateral force must be manned by personnel of the highest calibre. Each ship will be manned by a homogenous crew comprised of at least three nationalities. No one nationality would predominate. Member nations would be expected to provide personnel who, when trained, would man an elite force to provide tangible evidence of the cohesiveness of the alliance and a highly credible deterrent in the eyes of the Soviet bloc. So the emphasis was very much on trying to create an elite composite force of the most skilled personnel in order to generate a whole that was greater than the sum of its parts. But due to the scepticism that surrounded the multilateral initiative, it was deemed necessary, however, to conduct an experiment to demonstrate the feasibility of mixed money. National Security Action Memorandum number 253, dated 13th of July 1963, stated, the president, uh, at the time was President Kennedy, thinks that it would be helpful to the future of our efforts with the multilateral force if a beginning could be made in mixed manning somewhere in existing NATO forces. He would like a prompt study and report of the feasibility of establishing an experimental mixed man ship or ships in the Sixth Fleet for the purpose of testing the effectiveness of the mixed man concept and also of showing the continued interest of the United States in progress on this front. Now, notably, in regard to the demonstration, Robert McNamara wrote to President Kennedy, success of the project, both from a technical and political point of view, is mandatory. In this connection, any official publicity given to the project should emphasise the fact that its purpose is to assist in isolating and resolving some of the operational, administrative and personnel considerations involved in the mixed manning concept already generally accepted by the prospective participants, and in no sense, a test of the MLF itself. So in order to determine the feasibility of mixed manning, USS Biddle was recommissioned USS Claude V. Ricketts for an 18 month demonstration deployment to the waters of the North Atlantic and Mediterranean, following a recommendation from the Joint Chiefs of Staff that a guided missile destroyer, DDG, could most effectively fulfill the objectives of the demonstration. The demonstration was viewed as an opportunity to benefit, and then this is a quote, to benefit, uh, an opportunity to benefit from lessons learned during the operation and as a head start on the training of initial crews for assignment to the multilateral force. So in the end, the Americans provided the ship, half of the crew, the commanding officer who was Commander Thomas E. Fortson, and logistical support, with the remainder of Manning consisting of officers and enlisted men from West Germany, Italy, Greece, the UK, the Netherlands and Turkey. Although it should be noted at this point that the Turkish contingent was withdrawn before the transit of the ship to Europe. Now a memorandum of understanding was signed prior to the deployment, which was intended to underpin the cohesion of the crew. 
Personnel were essentially expected to be proficient in English, have a record of good conduct, and to be skilled in their professions. In addition, it was envisaged that those picked to join the crew would be prepared to develop, again, this is a quote, close social and working relations with other nationals. Although emphasis was placed on integration, personnel were still free to consult with and report back to their own navies. In practice, however, the ship was very much intended to operate as part of the US Navy as an American ship with a multinational crew. I'm just going to pause briefly here just to show a couple of images. Um, I've not put them in as transitions because of the potential of technical problems. So it's just an image there of, of then Rear Admiral Claude V. Ricketts pictured in, in 1959. He was very much an, an advocate of, of mixed manning uh, and was sent actually on a mission um, over to Europe um, to discuss the concept of the MLF and mixed manning. And that obviously ultimately resulted in the ship being named after him in the end. There's another image here uh, of sailors from Germany, Greece, Italy, the United States and the United Kingdom here aboard uh, the Claude V. Ricketts, receiving a briefing from the operations officer, Lieutenant Glenn Sedan. The interesting thing about the image, obviously, is the different uniforms worn by the crew, which ultimately ended up being a source of discussion after the fact. And the, the proposal by the commanding officer was that in any future force or demonstration, a, a single uniform should be worn uh, by the crew, but obviously at the time they had separate national uniforms. So I'll come on now to talk about the results of the demonstration, what actually happened during the operation itself. Now the MLF had prompted several concerns, as you can probably imagine, including the significant cost involved, and most notably control over nuclear weapons. So from the British perspective, for example, the perceived potential for the independent nuclear deterrent to be undermined was a source of great anguish. Now, these concerns would ultimately undermine the MLF concept, but the performance of the Claude V. Ricketts demonstrated the utility of mixed manning, despite several teething problems. Wilfred Cole concluded in 1965, the feasibility of mixed manning was at first highly controversial, but it now seems to have been accepted by the US Navy if the crews involved are highly trained and disciplined and operate with a common language. Now, that view was shared by Commander E.A. Bruckner, Commander Cruiser Destroyer Force Atlantic Fleet, who assessed that the many nagging problems of mixed manning were either solved or accepted gracefully, and in the process, a top-notch destroyer was produced. During exercises in the Mediterranean, Claude V. Ricketts was considered an integral element of the US 6th Fleet and was independently assessed to have performed excellently in numerous areas, including navigation, AAW, ASW, and gunnery. A report to the Paris Working Group from the Naval Representatives reviewing the mixed manning demonstration observed, the results of the annual competitive exercises among US Atlantic Fleet destroyers indicated that Ricketts compared very favorably in comparison with other like ships, since Ricketts was awarded an overall rating of excellence and stood high in the competition. And so ultimately, the experience demonstrated what could be achieved by sailors with different skill sets and approaches working collaboratively as a team. But nevertheless, despite the positive appraisals of the ship's performance, press reports in various countries suggested that there was unhappiness amongst the crew over the mixed manning arrangements. The demonstration exposed a number of friction points, including issues such as disparities in pay and responsibility for discipline. Some of the challenges had been anticipated in advance, but could not be resolved in the time available. Language skills in particular proved to be challenging aboard Claude V. Ricketts at times, despite the expectation that crew members would be proficient in English. So some of the international personnel that joined the ship via a stint at a US naval base received training ashore, but deficiencies in language skills led to English lessons being conducted by American and British sailors on the ship. Richard Preston has subsequently observed that the experience appeared to confirm the belief of those who argue that there must always be a single language of operation. Technical skills were also found lacking in some areas. For example, some members of the engineering department of the existing USS Biddle crew that were due to rotate out were ultimately required to remain on board while replacements were trained up to a, to a sufficient standard. So I think it's fair to say that the fact that the ship performed so well, despite the barriers that needed to be overcome, was testament to what could be achieved by a multinational mixed man crew. 
Therefore, although the MLF concept was eventually abandoned, John Hattendorf has concluded that the mixed Manning demonstration was successful as a short-term experiment. So I'll take a minute now to look at the factors that affected crew cohesion and effectiveness. While drawing lessons from an operation has proven to be a contentious subject, it is important to address the factors that affected the cohesion and effectiveness of the crew. The demonstration highlighted the importance of pre-deployment training and exercises. Now, there were disparities in how international personnel arrived on board the ship. So while those that arrived via a US naval base had benefited from the opportunity for relatively limited language or tactic, technique and procedure training, pre-arrival preparation was found wanting across the board. That resulted in indoctrination groups being formed to provide information on the mission, organisation and function of the ship. But even then, the commanding officer ultimately deemed that a structured pre-arrival course would be far more beneficial should the exercise ever be repeated. Proactive efforts by the crew themselves and in effect on the job training helped to redress shortfalls. Single and two-ship exercises sharpened the skills of the crew to the extent that the performance of the vessel was praised by the fleet training group. And it should be noted, despite Claude V. Ricketts only being able to conduct an abbreviated week-long shakedown as, as excellent. So if not perfect, the case of the Claude V. Ricketts, in the case of the Claude V. Ricketts, I should say, practice made the ship's crew highly effective. Now, the operation of the ship was very much simplified by the fact that US procedures were used exclusively. While that decision provided clarity, it also meant that training was required to ensure that international personnel were familiar with the tactics, techniques and procedures to be used. The demonstration very much emphasised the significance of standardisation, which had been highlighted during previous conflicts, including the Korean War, where it became uh, quite an extensive talking point between the Royal Navy and the United States Navy. So experience levels varied, but as shown by operations after the Second World War, familiarity obtained through exercising and working together was invaluable. The deployment also, though, underlined the importance of information sharing. Now, it was agreed prior to the deployment that personnel would be cleared to view American information, but tension arose over access to some material due to the use of US eyes only classifications. In one notable incident, a Dutch officer was unaware of the plans for the shore visit to Rotterdam in his home country, as the classification of the document precluded him from viewing it. So the classification of material and the technical provision to share information has always been a perennial concern and remains an ongoing challenge, as I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, as demonstrated by, for example, the, the use of SIPANET during operations in the early 21st century. So that's a historic challenge, but one that's also ongoing. Now, when discussing the concept of the MLF, Harold Macmillan, uh, British Prime Minister at the time of the discussions, affirmed that British members of the crew must feel they are the Queen's sailors. And so the distinction between a national and a multinational sailor was very much a point of contention. Now, the issue was not as pronounced by the time the demonstration occurred because the crew worked pragmatically together. But national boundaries did still prove to be limiting, as there was an occasional reluctance amongst officers to issue orders to sailors from another neighbour. Now, the importance of cultural interoperability was demonstrated in a number of ways, and efforts to maintain harmony were introduced. And we can maybe come to talk about some of this later during the questions. But there were attempts to cater for different dietary, dietary preferences and requirements, and cultural compromises were also implemented. So as an example, because of the, the different uh, nationalities and religions on board the ships, it was accepted that there was an impracticality of, of celebrating traditional national holidays. And so in that instance, the US sailors aboard downplayed Thanksgiving, for example, uh, despite the ship remaining part of the US Navy, in recognition of not every national holiday could be celebrated. So overall, the demonstration highlighted the importance of each aspect of interoperability, technical, procedural and human. Deficiencies in some areas did have the potential to undermine the efficiency of the ship and familiarisation and training were required to enhance interoperability amongst the crew. The performance of the ship was dependent on a commitment by sailors to work across national boundaries and operate collaboratively as part of a team. But rather than simply exposing the challenges of multinational cooperation, the demonstration also underscored the requirement for engagement between navies through a range of avenues 
including exercises, personnel exchanges, and international involvement in professional military education. Now, I think in reflecting on the demonstration, it would be easy to disregard Mix Manning as an esoteric Cold War novelty. The concept was tarnished by discord over the nuclear element of the MLF, but it was proven to be effective during the demonstration. Andrew Priest has rightly emphasised that Mix Manning is complex, expensive and politically difficult, particularly if attempted on a large scale and for any length of time. Tellingly, a report on the experiences of the Claude V. Ricketts observed in 1965, what men are prepared to accept for a short time with a definite terminal date in view may not be acceptable over the long term. Entirely composite crews consisting of personnel from diverse nations was disregarded as impractical in any permanent sense, but the feasibility of more limited mixed money initiatives has been evidenced by recent experience. And I'll just touch on a couple of those now very briefly. So during Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2003, then Captain Peter Jones, Royal Australian Navy, the Maritime Interceptions Operations Screen Commander, supplemented his staff of 18 with six officers and sailors from the Royal Navy. In that arrangement, the operations officers rotated as Jones's battle watch captains. More recently, a memorandum of understanding signed in 2014 by then United States Coast Guard Commandant Admiral Paul Zukunft and then First Sea Lord Admiral Sir George Zambellas led to Coast Guard personnel being provided to the Royal Navy on loan for 36 months to redress engineering shortfalls. While the exchange uh, of those personnel, including on board Royal Navy ships, did not constitute mixed man in the strictest sense, it did show the potential for relying on partner forces to supplement crews and enhance interoperability. The cliche that context is key is applicable when it comes to mixed manning. During discussions about the multilateral force, the Royal Navy, for example, was cautious of the idea because of the potential to drain the resources of the service. But as the demands on navies continue to increase, burden sharing is ever more seen as the solution as opposed to a problem. Now, the demonstration has often been judged against the potential feasibility and utility of the MLF or an equivalent. In assessing the Claude V. Ricketts demonstration, Lieutenant W.M. Kelly, who served aboard the ship, commented to the commander of British Navy staff in Washington, D.C., mixed manning is feasible, but it does not increase efficiency. However, I think it's fair to say that that analysis was based on mixed manning conducted for political rather than pragmatic purposes to add value to a Navy. Where there is scope to redress skill shortages and increase capacity of naval forces, international detachments have demonstrated the potential to provide significant enhancements. So that brings an end to my presentation today. Um, I'll stop sharing and put my camera back on. Is that working? Yes, that, that, that was great. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, Stephen, thank you very much for that great presentation. Um, fascinating side of the Cold War that we'll be talking about uh, here some more shortly. And I look forward to hearing some of your feedback as we move forward. Our next presenter is um, uh, Leo Doherty. Doherty. Doherty, I got, I got it right. Um, Dr. Doherty received his bachelor's degree in 1979 and master's from John Carroll University in Cleveland, Ohio, and a PhD from the Ohio State University. Uh, Dr. Doherty's primary research areas include the Interwar Marine Corps and the U.S. Army, and I, I should mention that you are uh, you're tired as a yeah, master, sergeant. master sergeant of the Marine Corps. Uh, the uh, kind of an individual who, who scared the death out of me when I was an officer <laughs> candidate uh, another lifetime ago. So, uh, but you didn't wear the smoky bear hat, I guess. No, no, no. <laughs> you never read an Edinburgh drill instructor. No. <laughs> All right. Um, he's written many books about the uh, Marines uh, and uh, amphibious warfare. Uh, U.S. Marines and counterinsurgency in 1899 and 2016. U.S. Marine Corps and the U.S. State Department. Enduring partners in United States foreign diplomacy, foreign foreign policy. And co-author of Paris Island, Cradle of the Corps. This through the U.S. Marine Corps recruit people of Paris Island. Currently finishing a book on Company E, 4th Tank Battalion at Fort Knox, Kentucky, uh, based for
Marine Reserve Unit in Tama, Kentuckians, all a journey of the U.S. Marine Reserve Unit in peace and war. And uh, currently, you are the senior command historian for the U.S. Army Cadet Command at Fort Knox. That, that's a mouthful. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> you didn't bring back any samples, did you? I, I wish I could have. Wow. Well, I'll send you a gold bar. I would love that. that would be, I know they're pretty heavy, though. So, uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I, unless I, I get killed trying to go through the gate there, you know, yeah. they say it's pretty deadly. You know. <laughs> I imagine. I've always wanted to visit. But anyway, without further ado, uh, Dr. Dorothy, I look forward to your picture. Thank you. During the 1950s, the focus of the U.S. Marine Corps and U.S. Navy base in Asia centered on the growing threats of the Union of Soviet Social Republics, the People's Republic of China, and the deteriorating situation in Indochina, and the potential of renewed hostilities on the Korean Peninsula. The standoff between the PRC and the Republic of China over Formosa or Taiwan and communist-inspired insurgencies in the Philippines, Malaya, and Indonesia required close cooperation between the 3rd Marine Division, based on Okinawa and Japan, the U.S. 7th Fleet, and their Southeast Asian allies. Complicating the international picture were issues over force structure, basing, and manpower, which gave rise to the inner service tension between the Commander-in-Chief, SINCPAC, Evan Felix Stump, his staff, and that of the Commander-in-Chief, Fleet Marine Force Pacific, Lieutenant General Edwin Edwin A. Pollock. The tension that arose between the two, these two individuals over basing and force structure nearly derailed a partnership forged the previous decade during World War II. This paper will briefly examine the controversies of basing, aviation, force structure, and manpower surrounding two very strong-minded individuals and the resultant impact of this controversy had on the debate inside the Marine Corps on force structure and basing in the Far East to meet a host of threats posed by, by the Soviet Union, China, and North Korea. Next slide, please. Appointed Commander-in-Chief, U.S. Pacific Fleet, on July 13, 1953, Admiral Felix Stump oversaw one of the largest staffs that was comprised of forces drawn from the U.S. Army, Air Force, and U.S. Marine Corps. Admiral Stump, a native of Parkersburg, West Virginia, and a graduate of the class of 1917 from the Naval Academy, and a naval aviator by training, had most recently served as Commander-in-Chief, Naval Aviation Atlantic, prior to his appointment as SINCPAC. During his tenure as SINCPAC, Stump, in fact, was known as the Flying Admiral, as he spent the majority of his time in his flying headquarters, a converted RC-6 transport aircraft, visiting U.S. commands throughout the Indo-Pacific areas, attending major conferences, such as the first major meeting of the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, or CETO, members in Melbourne, Australia, in, in January of 1956, to discuss security issues in the Pacific Ocean littoral. And this map right here will tell you the breadth of his command, um, that he had all, practically all, all the Pacific, going all stretching all the way to Pakistan. His command extended across all the Pacific Ocean, beginning deep in the Antarctic, following along the west coast of South America and then North America. Its responsibilities extended deep into the Arctic, bordering on a second unified command, Commander-in-Chief Alaska, or SINCAL, though was responsible for protecting sea communications in Alaskan waters, as well as operational and administrative responsibility for two bases in the Aleutians, ADAC and Kodiak. As then Lieutenant Colonel Alvin F. Erzik, U.S. Army, who served on Admiral Stump's staff assigned to the U.S. Army Staff Section, wrote, in quote, the St. Pack area of responsibility extended all across the Pacific, including the west boundary of Burma to the Indian Ocean to include Pakistan and a tremendous size of area and one that had great strategic significance. As Erzik noted, Admiral Stump's command satisfied many of the world's tinderboxes during the 1950s. These tender boxes included Taiwan and the Pescadores, Hong Kong, and literally all of Southeast Asia and East Asia. In essence, a third of the Earth's surface, over a hundred million square miles of territory. Erzik noted that this theater command is the most extensive ever placed under a single command, end quote. Admiral Stump's command was in fact a unified command. It consisted of forces assembled on bases in Japan, including Okinawa, the Marianas in Guam, and Saipan, 
Alaska, the Aleutians, and the west coast of the United States, and Hawaii. Besides his role as Commander-in-Chief Pacific, Stump held a dual role as Commander-in-Chief Pacific Fleet, SINCPAC Fleet, commanding the 1st and 7th U.S. Fleets. The headquarters of SINCPAC-COM and SINCPAC Fleet was on Oahu at Pearl Harbor. The U.S. Army, uh, with the newly arrived 25th Infantry or Tropic Lightning Division, was headquartered at Fort Shafter. The U.S. Air Force, or Compact F, okay, had its headquarters at Hickam Air Force Base, likewise on Oahu, with subordinate command spread throughout the Pacific. The U.S. Marine Corps was represented through the command established in 1944 in Kanihoe Bay, Hawaii later named Camp Holland M. Smith, and home to headquarters, Fleet Marine Force Pacific. Here, the commanding general, FMF Pack, oversaw the amphibious forces assigned to the 1st, 3rd, and 7th Fleets as well as control over marine forces on Okinawa, in the Ryukyu and Bonin Islands, and marine air-to-air -air assets based in Japan at Marine Corps Air Station Iwakuni, Japan, on, on Okinawa, and bases in California. In the 1950s, given the need for geostrategic issues such as renewed hostilities in Korea, this was in fact the largest maritime landing force in the world, with units spread all across the Pacific. While administratively under headquarters Marine Corps, the commanding general of FMF PAC reported to the Commander-in-Chief Pacific Command, meaning Admiral Stump. The CG FMF PAC, who was headquartered at Cunninghoe Bay, okay, directed the commands of all subordinate elements of the Navy Expeditionary Strike Force and Marine Air Ground Task Force components that follow under the under, under the various fleets, okay, and Marine Forces Pacific. The commanding general of Marine Forces Pacific is under the operational control of the commander of the United States Pacific Fleet when deployed, and according to Lieutenant Colonel Erzik, the number of Marines assigned to FMF PAC at this time numbered some 61,000 officers and men, making this the largest Marine command in the 1950s. As Sink PACCOM, Admiral Stump oversaw one third, next slide please, of the US Navy assets assigned to the Pacific Command, Pacific Ocean area a force of some 500,000 officers and enlisted men and women. Some 500 ships from aircraft carriers to submarine tenders and 2,500 aircraft comprising a Navy, Marine, Air Force, and Army. It was against this background that issues arose over the role and command relationship between Sin PACCOM and FMF PAC. And there emerged the perception among senior Marine leaders of the, in quote, junior status of the Marine Corps subjected to them by members of Admiral Stump's staff. The perception of this junior status of the Marines in St. Pac led to the tense relationship between the Admiral himself and Lieutenant General Pollock, who had been appointed commanding general in uh, Fleet Marine Forces in August of 1956. He didn't assume command, full command until January of 57. A clash of titans, next slide please. Against the background of the turmoil that shaped the post-war Asia, two individuals emerged who would play important roles in shaping U.S. military policy for nearly a decade in the Pacific Basin, Admiral Felix Stump and Lieutenant General Edwin A. Pollock. While Admiral Stump had graduated from the, from the Naval Academy, Pollock had graduated from the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina in 1921. Originally commissioned in the Army through Army ROTC, he resigned his Army Reserve Commission and accepted a regular commission in the Marine Corps, and after completing the Marine Corps' company officers course at Quantico, Pollock reported to Paris Island, South Carolina, prior to being assigned to expeditionary duty in the Dominican Republic in 1923. And after brief assignments to San Diego, um, he uh, would have sea duty aboard the US, uh, USS Galveston. He would serve in Nicaragua with the 2nd Brigade, as well as serving as a battalion commander later on during the Second World War on, on Guadalcanal. In fact, he won the, he would win the, the Navy Cross for the battle on the Tenaru River uh, in August or September of 1942. He served as a staff officer uh, during the Cape Luster operation and Iwo Jima campaigns. And after tours of headquarters at Marine Corps schools, he was advanced to the rank of Brigadier General in July of 1949. As early as 1949, General Douglas MacArthur, then Commander-in-Chief Far East, had designated Okinawa as a major strategic staging area in the event that the, Jap the Japanese islands excuse me, were threatened by the invasion by the Soviet Union. In fact, MacArthur's staff had planned that in the event of an emergency, quote, 
The main body of army forces would be concentrated on Okinawa, the Marianas, and Kanto Plains of Honshu. Those army forces located in Korea were to be precipitately withdrawn. With the defeat of the nationalist forces of Chiang Kai-shek in their evacuation to the island of uh, Taiwan, or Formosa, in the spring of 1949, and the deepening of the Cold War in Asia, including the ongoing communist insurgencies in Southeast Asia, this became an extremely important staging area position for projecting U.S. military power op no, operations excuse me, throughout Northeast Asia, and in fact, all of Asia. With the formation of the Southeast Treaty Organization in 1954, the United States being the largest contributor to the defense of Southeast Asia, had, had as Admiral Stump admitted, the largest Navy among member nations and thus had the lion's share of responsibility in projecting sufficient military power, both atomic and conventional in the Pacific Ocean littoral. Force structure and basing issues, next slide. One of the first issues confronting General Pollock upon assumption of command of FMF PAC in January of 57, and on that, and, and one that shaped his relationship with Admiral Stump was over the Navy's desire to reduce, and as he and his staff saw it, split up the marine and ground assets on Okinawa and the location of FMF PAC headquarters on Kanehoe Bay, and then spread them over the Pacific and the West Coast of the United States. As Pollock stated in his oral history, well, in quote, well, we, the Marines, built up Okinawa. We started building. There was a brigade at County Hoey. Then we had these little stations in the Pacific and in the Philippines, end quote. The issue over the presence of the Marines in Okinawa and Japan was, in fact, a source of great consternation between him and Admiral Stump. Pollock stating that Stump did not hide the fact that he wanted the Marines removed from Okinawa. Responding to comments made by, by Brigadier General Alfred F. Manning. Next slide, please. Next slide. Responding to comments made by Brigadier uh, Arthur Binney, Commanding General of the 1st Marine Aircraft Wing, in the presence of several high-ranking Navy officials regarding the conditions and the need to, in quote, get them the hell out of there, in quote. Admiral Larson. Admiral Beakley's chief of staff replied, well, you people got there yourselves, are there of your own accord, end quote. Pollock, in a follow-up letter to Benny, next slide, please, stressed that such comments only further inflamed the ongoing debate. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Well, I stressed that such comments only further inflamed the ongoing debate between him and Admiral Stump over basing and location of marine ground and air units in the Pacific. In part, Pollock told Boat Benny that the Navy has used every method available to prevent our, meaning the Marines, remaining on Okinawa and to stop the badly needed construction so necessary to the welfare of all Marines. Yet at the same time, they are using us to get themselves firmly established at Platina and Borough. Little as you know, yet you are playing into their hands, end quote. In the same letter, Pollock informed Benny that there is a constant fight going on to prevent the 3rd Marine Division and the 1st Marine Aircraft Wing from being split up into smaller units and bases and based on islands such as Timmy and Guam and a few others. There is also a study in being to send both units to Korea, thereby destroying our lifeblood of mobility and availability. There is also another serious attempt to send us back to the West Coast of the United States and oblivion, end quote. The FMF PAC commander concluded in his letter to Benny that we are all Marines and as such, I hope in the future that you will be more discreet in your discussions of Marine Corps plans and policies. Pollock not only had the problems with members of Stump staff, but also with his own staff who did not hide their dislike of the St. Patrick Fleet staff. During his nearly 18 months at CG FMF PAC, Pollock stressed above all else teamwork and loyalty. Comments such as those of Benny as well as Colonel, later Lieutenant General Victor H. Brute Krulak and Colonel Johnny Masters toward their Navy counterparts further irritated Navy Marine relations as Pollock sought to smooth the waters with Admiral Stump and his staff. Nevertheless, as Major General Alan, Alan Shapley, who's commanding general of the 1st uh, Marine Division, noted in his reply to Pollock, over such, such comments by Krulak, we have many roadblocks to overcome especially opposition from the Navy as to the advisability of having a division here on Okinawa. 
Shakely told Pollock that it was, in quote, dangerous to have Marine officer, officers sympathizing with the Navy, Navy's point of view, especially when it came to the Marine Air, which he wrote is the Navy's focus of opposition. One important part of the Navy's power projection in the Pacific Basin were the Marines of the 3rd Marine Division, based on Okinawa and the 1st Marine Brigade positioned at Kanihoi Bay. Next slide, please. The stronger of the two Marine commands was the 1st Marine Brigade and its aviation assets. One major issue that confronted Pollock as CGFMF PAC was over the training, supplying, and funding of Marine air units assigned to our higher headquarters. As Major General Shapley noted, aviation was one of the main sticking points between the Marines and the Navy in the Pacific. There had been some confusion in Marine aviation circle as to, in quote, who controlled what insofar as the training and funding of Marine air assets and to whose authority they answered to. In response to a letter from Major General C.C. Jerome, the uh, Commanding General Aircraft Marine, uh, Fleet Marine Forces Pacific, then headquartered at Marine Corps Air Station in El Toro, California, Pollock emphasized that when in the field or aboard carriers, Marine aviation units came under the control of higher headquarters, as stated in FMF PAC Order 201-56. Pollock reminded Jerome that responsibility for the training of such units remain under the control of U Air and Air PAC. Pollock added, however, that many of these policies were actions taken by this headquarters and were in accord with the Commandant of the Marine Corps policy and the best interests of the Marine Corps. Pollock, in fact, saw the 1st Marine Brigade as the only permanent air ground organization in being in the Far East, and as such, as his responsibility to ensure that it was ready to carry out Marine air ground operations. In keeping with this philosophy, Pollock, in a letter dated 7 January 1957, informed Major General Shapley that he had been in consultation with Admiral Stump regarding the use of aircraft carriers based to base Marine helicopters, participating in Operation Ajax India in January of 1957. Pollock told Shapley that, in quote, I told Vice Admiral Kurtz that unless we had a carrier to permit helicopters to operate tactically, next slide please, the maneuver would be a washout. And I think and hope one will be available, end quote. One last issue between SYNCPAC and the CGFMF PAC was over the location of the latter's headquarters on County Hoi Bay. With an expansion of the SYNCPAC staff that occurred in the mid-1950s as Asia grew in terms of both operational and strategic importance, Admiral Stump began pressuring headquarters in the Marine Corps to consider relocating FMF PAC headquarters along with the 1st Brigade to bases on the west coast of the United States, Camp Pendleton, Treasure Island, El Toro, and 29 Palms, all located in California. While the Admiral denied the claim that he was trying to diminish the presence of the Marines at Conneaut Bay, but the Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Randolph McCall Pate, and Pollock voiced strong opposition to this move on the part of Admiral Stump and saw it as anti-Marine, that move part of the Navy, especially Vice Admiral George Anderson. Admiral Stump, in fact, in a letter to the Commandant, vigorously denied any anti-Marine bias on the part of his subordinate. He wrote, as regards to George Anderson, you have been misinformed. He is an officer of outstanding judgment and ability and is definitely and positively not anti-Marine Corps. Any Marine who considers him an anti-Marine are doing the Marine Corps an injustice as well as to Anderson." End quote. In the same letter, Admiral Stump emphasized that his sole purpose in relocating FMF PAC headquarters was to utilize all available space at Conneaut Bay and on the West Coast. The St. PAC pointed out that a reduction of and relocation of the FMF PAC staff to the West Coast would enable both the Navy and the Marines to, in quote, to point out that they were doing their best to cut expenditures and keeping in line with the Eisenhower administration's new look and its desire to cut the defense budget. In short, the Admiral wanted to cut what he called the extravagance in the use of office space. As a solution, the Admiral proposed that older buildings be rehabilitated for use by FMF PAC staff. Insofar as the, the, the relocation of the 3rd Marine Division and the 1st Marine Aircraft Wing and the 1st Marine Brigade, the matter remained unresolved throughout 1957. 
General Pate, in a follow-up letter to Colonel Henry Buell, Pollock's chief of staff, at FMF, FMF PAC, wrote that after the discussion between himself and the chief of naval operations, Arlie Burke, the secretary of the Navy, Charles S. Thomas, uh, said that he was of the opinion that the two Henry headquarters could, if everybody tried, be operated from Camp Smith, end quote. Complicating the ongoing negotiations between the St. Pat fleet and the uh, CG of F FMF PAC over basing their marine units then on, then on mainland Okinawa was the U.S. Army's desire to utilize facilities on that island as a supply depot. Pollock, in a letter to Major General Edward W. Snedeker, assistant to the Commandant of the Marine Corps headquarters, saw the move by the Army as a more of a publicity and political stunt to get more into the forest readiness picture, end quote. Now, next slide, please. Okay, next slide, please. It was during this period that the findings of the Hogan Board, a board of Marine and Navy officers formed by the Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Randolph Pate, to examine the role of the helicopter and to what types of shipping they would require during an amphibious assault were published and implemented in landing exercises conducted by FMF PAC. During 1957, Pollock's first full year as Commanding General of FMF PAC, Marine Air and Ground Units assigned to the Marine Corps Test Unit 1 participated in several amphibious landings with the use of helicopters aboard the converted crab transport USSS Theus Bay. The Theus Bay was, in quote, the first of a series of ships converted to serve as transports for helicopter landing teams. For their part, the Navy, in endeavoring to meet the needs of the Marine Corps, recommissioned the old escort carrier in 1956, which became the first assault helicopter transport, LPH-1, later, later redesignated LPH-6. In 1956, General Paint appointed a board headed by Major Robert E. Hogeboom in order to conduct a thorough and comprehensive study of the fleet marine force and make recommendations to the, to the Commandant of the Marine Corps for the optimum organization, composition, and equipping of the fleet marine force in order to best perform its mission. Taking both the Navy concerns over amphibious shipping, the proximity of bringing ships within range of target beaches and naval gunfire, the Hogeman Board concluded that the basic tenets of amphibious assault had not changed and that, in quote, a mix of both vertical assault and traditional ship-to-shore landings of troops was still the optimal method of delivering troops ashore. The, the Hogeman Board concluded that this new concept of vertical assault was, in quote, proper. Despite the un, oftentimes tenuous relationship between the Marine Corps and Navy during the 1950s, both services found mutual ground in the belief that the amphibious assault was an important component in the projection of military power throughout the Pacific. In fact, Admiral Stump, in an attempt to smooth the water between him and Pollock, wrote the Commandant of the Marine Corps and emphatically informed, informed him that he was not, in quote, anti-Marine. And, that, and added that there had been a series of misunderstandings and error in judgment insofar as discussions over basing and force relocation, and that he held high estimate and admiration for the Marine Corps, end quote. He concluded the letter by once again emphasizing, next slide please, the importance of the Navy Marine Corps team, which he added, the Marine Corps cannot do their vitally necessary part in the defense of the United States. And then a rare comment, just a debate, I ain't mad at nobody, end quote. Throughout the remainder of his tour as FMF PAC, Pollock's relationship with Admiral Stump remained professional, though guarded. In spite of Admiral Stump's willingness to take Marine concerns under consideration, Pollock remained convinced that the Sink Pack did not like Marines. In his 1971 oral history interview with the Marine Corps History Division, he told Major Thomas Donnelly that relations with Stump were bad. When asked what bad meant, the Citadel graduate stated that relations between he and Stump were bad in the sense that he, Stump, was such a rambunctious old fella, and he never thought anything good of the Marine Corps, and never thought anybody in the Marine Corps was any good, end quote. Despite the outward appearance of cooperation between the two men, Pollock admitted, end quote, I was in a constant turmoil with him, but I got along with him all right. He was just playing downright mean, that's all, end quote. Pollock's resentment, resentment towards Stump was due in large part to the fact that Admiral could not say anything good about the Marines, even though, as Pollock himself admitted, 
he stopped appreciated the marine the marines but he didn't want you to know it end quote paula candidly admitted that end quote i told him what i thought and he told me what he thought so we all got along all right end quote the fact of the matter was that both pollock and stump were cut from the same cloth insofar as their attitudes toward their own services like stump pollock was defensive when he came when it came to his service in this case the marine corps pollock was of a generation of marine officers that could remember the impression among Marines during the 1920s and 1930s that the senior naval leadership thought very little of Marines, and in this case of the Marine Corps senior leadership, even though a few were in fact Naval Academy graduates. Now, on the other hand, Major General Norman Anderson, a Marine aviator and pioneer in, in the development of close air support tactics, recalled that his relationship with Admiral Arthur Radford, on the other hand, was both cordial and professional. In March of 1951, headquarters assigned then Colonel Anderson as a Marine Corps representative at St. Patrick Fleet headquarters assigned to the Pacific Fleet evaluation, where he studied and tested various concepts of close air support. After leaving St. Pat Fleet headquarters, he was assigned to the Marine Corps School in Quantico, Virginia in June of 1953, where, where he headed the air section's tactics and techniques board until 1956. While at Quantico, Anderson served as the air representative to the Hogeman Board. Reassigned to headquarters Marine Corps in February of 57, Anderson then served as Chief Policy Analysis Division. And after attending a six-week training course with the Jet Transition Training Unit located in Olaf, Kansas, he was ordered to the Far East in December of 1959, where he assumed command of Marine Air Group 11. And for the next 12 months, Anderson, along with MAG-11, operated at various times from airfields and aircraft carriers throughout the Western Pacific as part of the Marine Corps Mobile Readiness Forces. General Anderson recalled that while a member of the St. Pac Evaluation Group, he worked very closely with Admiral Arthur Radford, and that the most impressive thing about Radford was, in quote, his tremendous memory and ability to recall, concentrate and dominate a situation, end quote. Radford, Anderson added, was the most unusually capable man I ever ran into, end quote. General Anderson recalled that Admiral Radford appreciated the importance of the Marine Corps to fleet operations, and that without a doubt, I think his view, the totality of sea power, was greatly enhanced by a strong fleet Marine Corps. The veteran Marine aviator said that Radford's attitude may have been shaped by his close working relationship and friendship within Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Lamel Shepard, who by 1953, had been brought into the Joint Chiefs of Staff by the Chief of Naval Operations when Marine Corps matters were concerned. Anderson believed that Radford saw the Marine Corps as a balance, in quote, that could counter the influence of the Army and the Air Force, and, and that this greatly assisted the Navy in reducing the influence of the latter two services on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, vice the Navy. For Radford, in quote, the strength of the Commandant of the Marine Corps was important to, you might say, the sea power point of view of which Radford or whoever was Chief of Naval Operations was the principal spokesman. But Radford as Chairman certainly would encourage a further voice which would have been the Commandant of the Marine Corps. After leaving FMF PAC, Lieutenant General Pollock was appointed Commanding General Fleet Marine Force Atlantic from December of 1957 through November of 1959. He retired from the Marine Corps on 1 November of 1959, and his relationship with Admiral, next slide please, with Admiral Gerald Wright, Commander-in-Chief Atlantic Fleet, was in fact, it couldn't have been better, as opposed, in fact, he said it was more harmonious than that it was with Admiral Stump. After his retirement, Pollock, who had settled in Beaufort, South Carolina, and having been advanced to the rank of the Great General for his services during World War II, remained active in Marine Corps affairs especially at Paris Island and at the Citadel. In 1965, Pollock was instrumental in the founding of the Marine Military Academy in Harlingen, Texas, and after a brief illness, died on 5 November of 1982 and was buried in the National Cemetery in Beaver, South Carolina. During his last few years on active duty, there were rumors that Pollock would succeed Pate as Commandant of the Marine Corps. Major General Alan Shapley, in a personal note to Pollock, while he was still at the Pack, wrote, I can't help but say here that since I have been thinking about it lately, that you just have to be the next Commandant of the Marine Corps, and that it's a hell of a job, but you owe it to the Corps to take the job, and you must personally do everything in your power to enhance your position. Your record speaks for itself." End quote. 
Nothing, however, came of this as General David M. Shute, a favorite of President Eisenhower, succeeded Peyton as Commandant of the Marine Corps in 1960. Now, while there had been speculation that the accidental drowning of six recruits at Paris Island at Ribbon Creek and rumors that Pollock had either ignored or condoned reported abuses by Marine drone structures, referred to as thumping, during his tour as commanding general at Paris Island contributed to, to the decision not to appoint him CMC, these charges cannot be substantiated. As Shoup was, as above mentioned, President Eisenhower's and his successor, John F. Kennedy's choice to succeed Pate. As for Admiral Stump, after a career of 41 years, the veteran admiral retired as Commander-in-Chief of Civic on 1 August 1958. In his retirement, he served as Vice Chairman of Directors and Chief Executive Officer of Freedom's Foundation at Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Stump died of cancer in the, um, at Bethesda Naval Hospital in 1972. Next slide, please. As for the state of the Navy and Marine Corps relations, despite the tense working relationship between Lieutenant General Pollock and Admiral Stump, the evidence suggests that it remains strong and remained an important component of U.S. power projection capabilities in the Pacific Ocean during the late 1950s and 1960s. Despite the fact that both men remained jealously guarded over the roles of their respective services, both Pollock and Stump realized that cooperation and coordination of effort were key to the ability of the United States to meet the challenges of the 1950s in an extremely vital geostrategic area of the world. Both men readily acknowledged the importance of a viable Navy Marine team and importance the 13th Commandant of the Marine Corps, Major General John A. Lejeune, himself a Naval Academy graduate, wrote in a 1925 Proceedings article, where he emphasized the necessity that, in quote, that every Marine from general to the private must feel that he is of the Navy and in the Navy, and likewise that everyone in the Navy, from the four-star admiral to the man before the mast, must feel that the Marine is a part of the personnel of the fleet with, with a definite and clear cut line of duties to perform in the general scheme of naval operations in peace and war, end quote. General Alexander Vandegrift, the 18th Commandant of the Marine Corps, who was head of the Marine Corps, had been intensely involved in the post-World War II defense unification fight, commented, in quote, that amphibious operations are highly specialized. Amid all the other requirements for employment of the peacetime forces under conditions of shortage of funds and personnel, only a specialized organization closely integrated with the Navy can be expected to continue efficient training and development in that type of operation in, in war and peace, end quote. Lieutenant General Victor H. Krulak, who, whose views echoed those of General Pollock, perhaps best summed it up when he stated that given the distance involved and the type of power projection required, the maritime nature of the globe creates at once a great responsibility and an elegant opportunity and makes it a powerful statement of a truth that the Corps must never, and I repeat, must never forget their future ha as, as, their, as their past lies with the Navy, end quote. While both Stump and Pollock defended their service interests, they never lost sight of the requirements and the need for power projection in the Pacific, as well as the need for cooperation and compromise. It was this very need for inter-service cooperation and coordination that dictated the relationship between the two flag officers and forged the Navy Marine team that stood guard amidst Asia's troubled waters during the, during the mid to late 1950s. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lurie, for your outstanding paper. And uh, here we get. Hopefully, we can get uh, Stephen back up online and uh, have some great discussion about this. So, uh, again, thank you both for uh, your outstanding uh, scholarship and uh, papers today. Uh, very much appreciate it. Again, uh, two very different sides of the Cold War, I think you could say. Uh, one, like, a purely naval discussion. One, of course, about uh, Navy Marine Corps rivalry, but also cooperation. And uh, as, as you ended your paper, despite some Marines maybe grumbling, you know, the Navy and the Marine Corps will always be a team. And yep. uh, that, that, nothing's ever going to change that. No matter what anybody in the army has to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so 
I'll just make a few comments here and then we can get into some questions. And uh, I, have, I have a couple of questions for each of the panelists. And of course, we'll, we'll get into uh, our, our, our audience here as well. They should, I hope you all will chime in with some questions as well, please. I also uh, have some hand up when you get a chance to come up Well, just looking at the, uh, the calendar, I realize that we are coming up on the 30th anniversary of the end of the Cold War, if you count it from the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So uh, I doubt that will be celebrated much in Russia, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, I'm sure we'll have some discussion about it as we get closer to the end of the year. So I, as I said, uh, today's two papers offer very different accounts of the Cold War and poor structure. Uh, I think, and you probably agree, we barely scratched the surface of the Cold War oh, yeah. as a, in, in scholarship and historical opportunities. I've heard a lot of World War II historians say World War II is, is boundless, is a bottomless pit, and I think the Cold War is pretty much. Um, starting with uh, with Stephen's paper uh, on the Claude B. Ricketts, uh, again, thank you for that, Stephen. Just, uh, I, I had never heard of this uh, at all uh, in all my study of the Cold War and naval history. Uh, it definitely is a niche uh, account of, of the Cold War, and I mean niche as in a very particular event that we need to pay more attention to. Uh, it's fascinating. Um, just kind of a few observations. Uh, you know, the, some science fiction authors like to say that in the future, you know, ships out in space will be, will be manned not just by, by personnel from different countries, but also different planets. <laughs> uh, so this is in, in some ways pointing us toward the future, I, I think. Uh, but, and it's a very, it was a very forward thinking idea at the time. Uh, and it still is. Uh, you, you, you illustrated well the problems of integrating different crews and different, different cultures, different countries. Um, and I really liked, I don't know if you mentioned it here, but in your paper you mentioned how Thanksgiving was downplayed uh, because they didn't want the other, other crew members, not, not, not American crew members, to you know, feel left out. And I thought that was a fascinating example of how to make everybody fit in. Uh, Issues in pay and benefits, uh, that was a big source of contention, I know, between U.S., British, and Australian uh, soldiers and, and, and sailors in World War II. The British and the Australians didn't like how much the average American was being paid. To them. Uh, they thought they were being overpaid, and that, I'm sure, led to a few bar fights uh, uh, over the years. Um, the constraints on intelligence sharing and clearances, of course, that's a common issue. And you also illustrated about, of course, interoperability was one of your major topics. Um, that just brought to my mind a, uh, a, a very unfortunate and tragic uh, example, the USS John McCain collision in 2017. Uh, you had members from a different ship that were on board, training, serving on board. They did not have the full knowledge of the equipment. That led in part to the collision. Because they did not have the full experience of because they came from a cruiser, different controls, different mechanisms. They weren't used to it. That was a, a small part that led to that tragedy. So, how difficult is it to integrate men from other navies into a, a, another ship from a U.S. Navy, unfamiliar with our, our procedures and, and our equipment? Uh, that's a, you know, a big part of the challenges for interoperability from different countries. Uh, but in other cases, I know in recent examples, I want to bring up another example I'm familiar with. I think about five, 10 years ago, we had uh, an example, the Charles de Gaulle and one of our carriers were operating together, the French aircraft carrier, and we successfully landed an E-2 Hawkeye on the Charles de Gaulle, one of our aircraft landed on board. So we demonstrated that carriers from different navies could operate together and land their own aircraft on each other's decks, which was a huge accomplishment. Uh, uh, you know, for modern aircraft and modern naval aviation. So, uh, I, I do have, uh, actually I'll get to this question in a minute and, as we open up for everyone else. Uh, Dr. Darby's paper, I just want to make a few comments on that. Excellent research. Uh, your photos were outstanding. Uh, I, I know you did a, you, you drew a lot of archives in Paris Island as well. Um, my own dissertation was on the Navy Marine Corps operations in post-war to China, uh, operations the Leaguer and uh, the 
efforts there to shore up Shanghai Shex government, among many other things. Um, obviously, Navy and Marine Corps problems and disagreements were very much present there, and that continued into the 1950s for sure. Uh, the Hogaboom Board, that was extremely important uh, an event that I think doesn't get enough attention. I like that, of course. And of course, the differences between Stump and Pollock. Two officers that I think uh, are not as well known as they should be, and uh, you highlighted their importance and, and the, the critical differences, between them. but also the fact that, I mean, as you pointed out, I think, yes, they had their tremendous differences, but they still managed to work together, I think, when I counted them, mm -hmm. and uh, that was critical. Um, the, I, I, I we'll get to questions here in a minute, but uh, if you had a lot of, uh, the oral history that you cited on, from Pollock, Talked about stump, but I was I, I was curious if maybe you can answer this in a few minutes about if there was as much stump on Pollock if he made any like I have comments that I can answer. Okay, so we'll get to that in just a minute. So uh, in the 1950s, the Mar Marines, with, starting with of course you mentioned General Vandergrift, his famous bended knee speech, uh, where he just pleaded for the survival of the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps came very close, depending on how you look at it, to being dissolved or you know, uh, absorbed in, into the Navy or into the uh, Army in, in the late 1940s. So it wasn't just the Navy that was fighting for survival, well, it was the Marine Corps as well. In some ways, it was a more dire situation. So the Marines wanted to assert their independence and assert their, you know, their, their traditions and their importance in the 1950s. Uh, but, you know, both the Navy and Marine Corps realized that they needed each other mm -hmm. it, it, immensely. Yes. And uh, there's, there's no way getting around that at all. So uh, those are my, I should say, comments, and we can get, I don't know if we can get to, you, you want, if you want to answer your, your question. The, the question, uh, yes, Dr. Siobhan asked, okay, about um, Admiral Stump. Yes, I did use Admiral Stump today, and in fact, I'm surprised I didn't cite it okay. But yeah, uh, he does mention very briefly, right, and, he, and he actually has a, second, a, a small, about, about a paragraph and a half, talking about Marine Corps Air Support in the Second World War, as he said, which was fantastic. But after that, he drops off, and I went through the whole, the second half of the uh, oral history, and there's nothing, you know. But you know, I am going to say this about his oral his, his oral history transcript, okay, which I might I received from Cornell. Okay, they were very kind in, in getting it to me. Um, that the fact that he, you know, it's a it's a wealth of information on U.S. politics in, in Indochina, which I you know I've never seen even cited, you know, in, in other sources of the Vietnam War. Admiral Stump played a very pivotal role. Uh, in the 1954 discussions at uh, Geneva, as well as advising J John Foster Dulles okay, on U.S. Asian policy, which I, I was very surprised about that he talks about that in his, in his, in his oral history. Um, his oral history is fantastic. I mean, just reading it, but he didn't talk about Pollock. Now, Pollock talks about stone, you know. Right. Um, and uh, it, it, that's what really threw me. I just you say, okay, I'm looking for Pollock. Okay, you know, but don't do that. You know, like you're going through, a, you know, an oral history. I can't find anything, you know. Um, I have a personal anecdote, if I might say. Please, please. You know, and I'm going to tell you about the nature of General Pollock, okay. Um, my dad was stationed at Paris Island, okay. That's, in fact, I was born in the Naval Hospital. I'm you know, Navy Marine all the way through, you know. And Marine Navy, um, I'll say that. Um, but anyways, General Pollock, my dad was assigned to 2nd Recruit Training Battalion, and his commanding officer was... Uh, Oscar Petrus, who one day had their bike plan running a book on, but they, they went to a graduation. General Pollock, as his habit was, every every Friday morning, he would review a graduating series. He's up and my dad said they're up in the review stand, they're watching, they're watching. General Pollock go up and down, and he comes close to a Marine. And the Marines, two buttons on his blouse are unbuttoned, and his belt's not aligned. General Pollock grabbed him, said, This man's going back to day one. <laughs> General Pollock, you know, he was, as I stated in the paper, he was a generation of Marine Corps officers that demanded excellence and demanded loyalty. He was fair. He was a fair man. My dad said that he was one of the best command generals that he had as, at, at Paris Island, you know. And he said that General Pollock, well, he was tough. He was, he was I guess I'm going to say he was a tough old coot. He really was. I mean, he just, and, you know, he said that Admiral Stump was a ranked most soul man. I think General Pollock also could probably fit into that category. But, he loved the Marine Corps, and he went his visits to Paris Island in the in the in the uh, in the sixties and seventies. Okay, 
he would review the graduation. They invited him to every graduation. And, you know, he he just personified, I'm going to say, a Marine officer of, of that era. He really he really did. And on the other hand, Admiral Stump did with the Navy. I, you know, I mean, I've studied naval, naval officers all the way from the first, you know, the beginning of the 20th century. And he, he was a true professional. He really was. And I, I came to admire it at Admiral Stump. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that because I'm here, okay, but uh, Admiral Stump, was, he, was, he also was professional, and he loved the Navy. You have two individuals that love their services, okay, and they're, they're, they're butting heads, yet they, I think they both understood the, the relationship between the two services. I, I, Steve, I, I do have a question. Yeah, you have a you, question. Well, let, let me ask oh, a question. Say. I have a question for Stephen, and uh, before we get into the audience here, uh, you mentioned uh, Commander Fortson, the the CO of the uh, that was assigned to the Ricketts, but I, I couldn't find in your paper if there was any. If maybe it doesn't exist. How what he thought of the experiment? Uh, if, the, if he has any records, or the XO of the ship has any records, if they have any comments, because you mentioned some of the admirals that. Put in their commentary or their analysis afterwards, but uh, did you find anything on, on Commander Fortson or, or on what, as the CEO, he thought of the uh, of the Ricketts experiment? Yeah, I think I think a lot of officers. He was generally quite positive um, about that. Um, I think some of the logistical arrangements were a source of frustration. This is some negatives I mentioned. I think in the paper, some of the arrival uh, aspects, pre-deployment training. Um, I, I, don't, I think there was a sense that the working group that kind of thought up the idea had not necessarily ironed out all the practicalities. So he, he was very much setting recommendations to what he thought should occur in the future. But he was he was generally quite positive about it. I mean, he was picked for the operation because I think he was a he was a fairly approachable and, and pragmatic officer. Um, so he's he generally generally quite positive about it and reasonably open. I think um, you know this, when some of those press reports start coming out about crew unhappiness. Um, again, you know, he's reasonably pragmatic about it, saying, you know, these are these are honest complaints. People have concerns, and I think he realised the challenges. But I think overall, it was it was it was viewed positively, All despite right. the obvious limitations of, of operating a, a, a mixed man crew on a kind of extended level. Excellent. Thank you. I have a question for Stephen. Sure, Stephen. Uh, one of the questions that I have about this uh, interoperability, okay, uh, primarily revolves around officers, okay, because they would have to have access to classified information. You know, the U.S. has this really uh, tight system, okay, of classification of, of uh, classified material. Did this serve as a problem during interoperability? Yeah, it was. I mean, it was it was it was recognized beforehand. And I think certainly some of the navies that work closely together. I mean, it's one of the things that comes up even during the Korean War um, concerns about that. And so it was discussed beforehand and it was agreed that, that the officers would have access to the, the information that they required. And I touched on one example of, of USR's only classification there that meant officers couldn't gain access to national material. And the idea of the deployment was it was supposed to be fairly open. Officers could communicate back to their own navies. There was nothing to stop that. Um, but I think in reality, one of the complaints that come out of this which which i think is a, is a fairly common complaint around this period of time in the early cold war particularly uh around the, the korean war period and and the decade after that is that the americans are seen to to play by the rules too much and that there's less pragmatism there and so yeah it did, be, it did become a sticking point and obviously there's one of the inherent challenges because of course this was a mixed man demonstration to lead to a multilateral nuclear force so the stakes would potentially be much higher later on so that that uh, command and control and information sharing as, as two separate pieces, but connected in some ways, were, were contentious before the deployment and, and end up being so during. Okay, we'll open it up to the audience if you all have some questions. Uh... Yeah. Hi, I'm Sean Walsh. I'm a retired engineering duty officer and uh, uh, naval architect and volunteer for the Naval Historical Foundation team. I'm not really qualified as most of the people here are, but by educational background. I was going to say on uh, the uh, paper on the uh, rickets. So I deployed in 1978 uh, on a BDG to the Standing Naval Force Atlantic, which, and one question is, my understanding always was that was kind of an outgrowth of the rickets experiment of having, you know, it's a, I think it still exists. Basically, it's, it was only the Northern European NATO navies, but basically one destroyer. So we had Canadian, uh, Commodore leading it, the, when we were deployed, we had, a, like I said, a U.S. ship, we had uh, 
rotating series of British frigates. We had a Dutch ship for most of the time, we had a Norwegian ship, uh, German, and then we had, uh, for part of the time, Portuguese. So that was the only one, you mentioned language, and language was really, Portuguese were the only ones we really had language issues with. Uh, what it, also thinking, well, one thing is the cultural. Uh, so I'm wondering in your research, was there any mention about the lack of alcohol on the uh, brickets? Uh, and if that was a cultural issue for the other uh, navies. Uh, also, holidays, I'll mention that we uh, were in Roseleith, Scotland in early July and actually got underway on the 4th of July, which we <laughs> thought was somewhat unfair. <laughs> Uh, and the last thing was, so, you know, so we had uh, Allied Tactical Publication 1, uh, it was version Bravo at the time, uh, and that was had all the standard, you know, code signals in it. We did have a U.S. supplement, uh, but, you know, we used that for flag hoist, we used that for voice communications, you know, the Bravo Zulu for well done is in there. Uh, do you know when, did that already exist at that time? You know anything? Because that's certainly been an interoperability thing, you know, for maneuvering ships. I'm not sure the exact dates when that came out, but I mean, Steve, you, you want to uh, address the other questions about uh, what he was referring to, about the, the kind of the successor to the Ricketts? Yeah, no, yeah, definitely. So the, the standard naval force, um, yeah, some degree can be seen as, as having developed from the Ricketts, but particularly the, M the MLF concept obviously you know changed the nature of it entirely but certainly that idea of a, of a multinational force and and a more unified force you can certainly see uh, as, as having resulted from that at least in part so i think yeah that's definitely definitely true um i think coming back to the cultural piece you mentioned um yeah there's a, there's a few sticking points there um alcohol funnily enough did come up and again that's uh that's another thing that you see appear in the documents over a number of different multinational operations and um Macmillan had reportedly said in their discussions about this, you know, the people seriously expect Royal Navy sailors to, to share their grog with, with some of their international counterparts. Of course, he didn't realise the deployment ultimately would end up being based on the US Navy and dry, so it became an irrelevance anyway. But yeah, there was some discussion around that and uh, Royal Navy sailors reportedly received minimal financial compensation for the fact that they no longer had access to, to alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> during the during the deployment but that was yeah i mean and also dietary requirements as well efforts were made to cater to, to particular national tastes and that got a kind of mixed reception at times i think um but that that was uh one of the the interesting challenges of that um so yeah culture culture is a big challenge Technic technically as well i mean going back to the ddg thing because you know other navy you know they're looking at the royal australian navy that acquired the ddgs you know, it would have been an interesting dynamic to see what a multinational uh, crew might have looked like, for example, of US and Australian sailors that were both familiar with the Charles of Adams class destroyer, and then obviously much more familiar with tactics, techniques, procedures on board that ship. So so culture culture was, you know, a challenge that there was people were aware of and tried to address. Um, but, you know, there, there were obviously still sticking points in that. I, I would want to make a comment of my own uh, you know, service uh, and we like to say, of course, the U.S. Navy is dry, but there are a few exceptions to that. Um, under current Navy regulations, at least this was true about 20 years ago, you can have beer served on board Navy ships if they've been underway for 45 days or more. Uh, my own personal story about that, I was underway on the Sinus, my second deployment. The CO allowed us to do this, but he did it about 50 days to coincide with the Super Bowl. So we were watching the Super Bowl about zero one in the morning with a beer, and that was you never forget. That. They actually have the a beer on their way, yes. and uh, so that yeah, it's it. But as to your point, I mean, yeah, the differences between how we deal with alcohol and how the British and, and all the British Commonwealth navies deal with it is, is it, that I'm sure led to some friction. Mitchum, do y'all have any questions? I'd love to hear from y'all today. Oh, sir. Michael Binder, Air Force Declassification Office. This is for Stephen. You mentioned the Polaris as being the missile for the MLF. There was a new weapon system, the Mobile Medium Range Ballistic Missile, the MMRBM, which never came to fruition. Was that a land-based missile, or was that also possible for the sea forces? 
Um, I don't think that was that was ever part of the discussion. Although interestingly, um, there were parallel discussions going on uh, at the time about possibly having V bombers, a mixed man V bomber crew as well for aerial delivery. Um, so, so different missile systems were considered for these uh, multinational forces. And originally, going back as I mentioned, the, the original idea was that it'd be a submarine-based force. That ended up not happening for a, for a number of reasons, mm -hmm. cost that the technical skill required was deemed to be too great. So there were there were discussions about different missile platforms, but I don't think it ever, as far as I'm aware, formed part of a, a serious discussion for, for the force. Um, so one thing is to decide I have to think about with the nuclear weapons and exchange officers. I have the, the image of uh, Captain Mandrake uh, from, uh, which was one of the characters Peter Sellers played in Doctor Strangelove. Oh yes, <laughs> yeah. come, of course. That's a come to mind. Uh, but uh, the other thing is I'm thinking about with your paper the you know how much I don't know maybe it's just my age but how much the but I'm looking at the pictures of you know, how much scarier and sterner looking the flag officers and general officers look <laughs> than the present day. Well, uh, Although the Marines still kind of still have it be the, the, the still kind of thing. much sterner look. I, I've met General day. Berger, the commandant in person. He's, he, he's very he, like that too. Really. Yeah, he, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's very <laughs> you know, well, I mean, you know, you, you're talking about, you know, sir, you're talking about, you know, uh, an officer, you know, in, in the case of General Pollock, okay, who had served in expeditionary duty in the Dominican Republic as well as Nicaragua. Um, and you know, I mean, my wife and I talked about this, Dr. Smith here, okay, we talked about this sometimes, you know, I mean, you know, Marines, we, I, I guess we aged a little harder or something like that, you know, I guess it's our demeanor, you know, but no, I mean, he, you know, he just was, he was campaigning, he had that tan, you know, and most Marine officers had that tan, it was back in, back in, you know, the 30s and the 40s, you know, I mean, plus, you know, he also probably had malaria. Okay, you know, you know that that probably served a lot. I mean, after being that doesn't do wonders to the body, you know. So uh, it's um, something uh, that he he was he just he was crusty, and, and Admiral Stump was probably just as you know they, they smoked back then, you know, and they were they were very heavy smokers, you know, and but they they lived the life, you know, so to speak. But they also scowled at the camera too. They scowled, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not very photogenic. They weren't photogenic babies, I guess you could say. But they didn't want to portray that image of being soft. So, now, if you look at General Lejeune, Lejeune or Jern, okay, he had that more of it's like. But if you see other photographs of him, he was kind of rough looking too. You know? I think maybe all the Marines want to look like Jesse. I mean, I don't want to look like Jesse. I'd rather look like Jesse <laughs> myself, you know. Um, Pollock, like, like I said, my dad, my dad, you know, many nights my dad would sit and talk about John Pollock. He just said that the guy was, I mean, he just was tough. I mean, he had tough policy at Paris Island, too, about liberty and everything else, too, you know. I mean, and but he, he was fair. He was a fair man. Please. Excellent. Um, what's your forecast for everyone? Um, I didn't really get to hear too much at the beginning of the brief, that class, but I had a part. Talk about the Marines being close to being dissolved in the 1950s. Can you speak to why that is and why it didn't happen? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Yes. Sorry. Yeah. You talked about the Marines being close to being dissolved in the 1950s. Can you speak to why that didn't happen? Being like, why, why were they close to being it was, dissolved? It was the late 1940s, actually. But yeah, why, why, the, why the Marines, the, the discussion about like getting rid of the Marines or Oh, you know, yes. Yeah. Well, that, that that of course occurred with the unification fight because they thought that with the atomic bomb that they would not need an amphibious landing force. They felt that the, that the landing forces would be so would be vulnerable to an atomic blast. Okay, once the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union, once the Soviet Union, you know, developed nuclear weapons. Okay, that an amphibious landing uh, of a World War II style would never would never occur again. And in fact, that's why you know the Marines and the Navy worked on vertical assaults. From the ship, okay. That the, you know, Navy. You know, the Navy has a rule that they'll never go in. What is it? More than sixty miles, or like you know, they they they, they limit their 
access to the beach or though they're distance from the beach okay and that means that the marines are going to have to find some method of coming ashore other than in the traditional landing crafts okay and that's why you know there was there was talk a lot of talk saying that the, that the marines are out there you know, that were out there in fact that's why today this same discussion is going on with general Berger. okay um i did i didn't want to i didn't want to step on this but I, but i'm going to okay um, there's a lot of opposition to what he's doing. Okay, there, there's a lot of talk. Okay, that he wants to, that he's taking away from the Marine Corps our traditional assault capabilities. Okay, yet I guess his wisdom he knows, but he knows better. Okay, but and I, I as I read the documents today, I say this is like reading in the 19, late 1940s again. You know, here, here we go again. You know, we're talking about again. Are the Marines relevant? To further answer your question, if I just kind of jump on this, you know, um, the inshot landings were huge because obviously mm -hmm. Secretary of Defense at the time, my people were, was on a little bit a couple years before this. Louis Johnson. Uh, yeah. James Forstall, first Secretary, of, well, you no, know, you're, you're right, you're by Johnson. His predecessor was very pro Navy, very pro Marine Corps. Louis Johnson took over and was very pro Air Force. And he literally told the Navy CNO, is the Navy is going, and the Navy Marine Corps are going away. You can't do what the Air Force, the Air Force can do everything you can do. So we don't need, need you. As difficult as, as that is to believe. But then Inchon happened, the Korean War happened, the car that demonstrated that, yes, you could do an FDB's landing. Now it's true, we haven't done one in 70 years since. A major, we almost did one at the Gulf War. It was a feint. Uh, it was a ruse. We didn't actually do it. We just planned for it. We trick the Iraqis that we would. Uh, but you know that saved, and that that was part of saving the Marine Corps. That yes, we can still do it with this capability during the Cold War. That's part well, of the answer. Well, during you know this this is going this has always come back time and time again. Do we need a Marine Corps? It is a Marine Corps needed. Do we need an amphibious force capable then? I mean, we have the Army Airborne, like they have special forces, okay. But yes, you do because one of the things that was validated during the Second World War, and what Dr. Shavon said about about Inchon, it revalidated the concept of amphibious assault, but maybe in a different way. Okay. And and this this debate this debate's ongoing. In fact, it'll follow you through your career. Okay. It's, is the Marine Corps relevant? Yes, it is. Is the Navy relevant? Yes, it is. Okay. And my mother said it the best. We need all the services because each service brings to the plate a different capability. I was just getting well, obviously, you know about this, but they were both the you mentioned uh, Krulak, and he had been a member of what was the Chowder Society? The Chowder Society. Yeah, but yeah. both the Navy and the Marines during the unification fight had kind of undercover groups that were putting stuff out. Gallery and Burke were both involved yeah. on the Navy side, and then Krulak, and I think Hiddle was on the uh, Marine side. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah so that. For putting that in Truman was anti Navy as well. And some of the animosity supposedly went back to World War One. Yes, with the book yeah, 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 yeah. That Truman, the Marines yeah. got because their embedded correspondent wasn't censored the way that the uh, that the uh, Army embedded uh, correspondents were. Yeah, well, I mean, Dr. Zerman talks about Inchon, okay. You know, MacArthur hated the Marines. He, he really did not like the Marines. You know, he made the comment, well, the Marines got too much publicity in Bellawood. You know, I'm going to make sure that's not going to happen again, you know. Uh, uh, Eisenhower, Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, for his part, was not really pro Marine because he wanted to reduce the Marines to regimental landing teams, okay, and that was it. Uh, and, you know, and again, I, I, and then along came, of course, you know, you, you need a Marine Corps. Along came President Kennedy. Kennedy liked the Marine Corps in the Navy. He, he liked the Marine Corps. You know, and you know, he, he visited uh, San Diego in 1961 after becoming president, and he made the state that, that, that there will always be a Marine Corps as long as he's president. I don't want to even go into what happened in 63, but you know. hey, we're, we're just about out of time if we have for anyone has any last question or two. Uh, for the midshipman, if you would like a copy of the paper, I got it. Yeah, if you want to put your email up here, I can send it. I, I will. I will gladly send you a copy of the paper. Thanks again to our, our panelists and our, and our uh, presenters. I just uh, one out of one. Thank Stephen, thank, thank you again. Stephen, thanks. That was a great paper.
Yeah, no, thank you very much. Sorry I couldn't be there this year. Um, hopefully next time. Yep. Back in the building. When we go back to normalcy, we'll, we'll have real beer, not virtual beer. Yeah, virtual beer. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Of course, the other thing.